zombies, cheerleaders, and terror strong hype. These were the ingredients chosen to make the perfect video game. But this was not enough, and so an extra ingredient was added by the name of James Gunn. And thus, Lollipop Chainsaw was born. Using the power of a chainsaw, Juliet, Nick, and her chainsaw have all dedicated their lives to fighting zombies. Released on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 back in June of 2012, from Grasshopper Manufacturing Incorporated, Lollipop Chainsaw is a game that holds nothing back with its absurdities. Depending on the player, the choices made in this game can either be taken as jarring or hilarious, to say the least. What makes this game all the more interesting is its duality of reception amongst different consumer bases. Over here in the West, many media outlets did not receive the game favorably. Eurogamer, for example, gave the game a 6 out of 10 stating that, despite its clever but patchy script and performances, there isn't enough fun lurking in the combat. The levels also last longer than they should, and the jokes that come with them aren't witty enough to hold their keep. Lollipop Chainsaw is a sugary, colorful, insubstantial, and perhaps a bit sickly with it. The gaming magazine Edge, which gave it a 7 out of 10, had this to say, it's a game that's wonderfully stylish, but at the same time ugly both visually and thematically. The risque jokes at Juliet's expense and repeated encouragement to not look up her skirt wears thin soon. While I could elaborate on more Western outlets, the consensus was that Lollipop Chainsaw had its fair share of good ideas, but its execution, much like the gameplay, was all over the place. Contrary to the Western market, though, comes Japan. While I could not find its reception in the form of reviews over there, I did check out the main website of the game, which is still up today. One thing to note about this website in particular is the number of costumes that this game received. I could be wrong here, but terrible games normally do not receive support outside of launch. This game contains multiple outlets for Juliet, ranging from High School of the Dead to Foxy Funk, whatever that is. Additionally, Famitsu gave the game a 9 across the board, totaling 36 out of 40, allegedly. The reason why I said allegedly is because this was the only source I could find on that specific review. Regardless, that was then, and this is now, and as a person who has never played this game before, I decided that it was time to. So with that being said, I want you to join me as I share my thoughts about what made Lollipop Chainsaw a cult classic. Now, to make this easily digestible, I've broken the game down into categories. These categories will be the gameplay, the story, the voice acting, and its replayability. So, let's begin. The gameplay in Lollipop Chainsaw is that of a traditional hack and slash. Juliet, who is the main character, has a wide moveset that blends pom-poms, acrobatics, and chainsaws all together in a fluid but also haphazard manner. Speaking of that word, Haphazard is the theme of this game in general, as you will soon find out. Anyways, Juliet's moveset can be expanded over time by purchasing new skills from the Chop 2 shops throughout the game. While I did not purchase every single move in the game, there were a couple that came in handy, such as the Chainsaw Chain and Armadillo Spin, amongst maybe one or two others. Now, I do find that a bit bizarre though, as this game features a long list of moves that can be added to her arsenal. Yet, a majority of the moves I purchased did not add any value to her kit outside of the ones I mentioned, which brought in a much needed AoE or gap closer. This is not me saying that I simply chose to ignore the different moves in the game, but more so that some moves were worth using way more than others. Additionally, once Juliet has dealt enough damage to the zombies around her, she can activate her star soul power, which is shown at the bottom left of the screen. In this star soul power state, she is capable of one-shotting most enemies in the game, which also nets us bonus currency towards purchasing more moves, in-game music, and stat upgrades. While it's true, this move gets the job done, I wish there was more variety in her specials, as it's not every day you get to play as a cheerleader with a chainsaw. But moving on, Juliet also obtains some long-range weapons in the form of a chainsaw blaster. Yes, I kid you not, that is the actual name of this power. And let's not forget about Nick, who is her boyfriend, who is also just a head now. Interestingly enough, this game from a combat perspective appears to offer a lot of different options for the player, but in reality, there are just some abilities that are far more efficient to use than others. Outside of these skills being more productive on the battlefield, the janky controls in this game do not promote experimentation either. 
One would think that with a chainsaw and a horde of zombies, it would be easy to cut them down. Yet in my case, I found it harder at times to fight a crowd than one on one, as a lot of the move animations lock you into place. There were also times when enemies ignored my moves and would just knock me to the ground. So at times combat, which is the main selling point of the game, can be more frustrating than enjoyable. Now it is obvious that this game isn't Devil May Cry or Bayonetta, nor does it claim to be. But listen, if you are going to break into that genre, then you should at least be prepared to bring some heat. It is fine if combat is not perfect, as long as the movement is solid or vice versa. But in the case of this game, it does not excel in either, though it's not bound to a certain level of creativity like other games normally are. Moving on to the story of Lollipop Chainsaw, well, let's be honest with each other here. It exists, but it is meant to be shallow, grating, and hopefully humorous. The story of Lollipop Chainsaw focuses on the main character by the name of Juliet Starling and her boyfriend Nick, who is reduced to a magical talking head, and her bizarre family who happens to be zombie hunters. You don't think they are weird, you say? Oh, well, let me play this introduction clip to the family for you. Friends say my dad is a total dill, but try as they might, they could never come between him and my mom. She is so cool. It's because of her, my sisters and I all wear our vaginas proudly. God, she and my dad love each other so much. You heard that correctly. So if you made it this far into the video, I hope I have your attention once again. Anyway, the story takes place in a couple of different areas in the fictional town of San Romero. The first area is Juliet's high school where Juliet is 18 by the way. She immediately states that detail at the start of the game, which if you know, you know. Then goes to the stadium, followed by the farm, a fun center, and lastly a cathedral. The main villain of the game is a goth geek by the name of Swan, who is the leader of the Dark Purveyors. These Dark Purveyors are super zombies and also serve as the boss fights for each stage. Naturally, they have their own little gimmicks which I do appreciate, though some are far more annoying than others. Like the first one you fight who goes by the name of Zed. <laughs> I'm gonna crush your face! <laughs> I'm loving this shit! Now the other purveyors are nowhere near as grating as Zed. Josie, for example, is one of the purveyors that I found to be cool as each of his phases gets more over the top than the last. Hey, you promised you'd give her back if we won. <laughs> you just did what I said. <laughs> I'm a mother freaking zombie. Drop the chainsaw now, ho. Hey, baby. Oh, e. On one hand, I do appreciate the variety in the battles between the purveyors, but on the other hand, it just goes to show how haphazard this game is. One fight can be brilliant, but the next is mediocre at best. Speaking of that, the final face-off against Swan, who became a part of Killabilly, is neither satisfying nor mechanically exciting. I had more fun fighting Lewis than Killabilly, but your mileage may vary. When it comes down to it, the problem with Swan is more so that he is a backseat villain with no real presence more than anything else. But with the Killabilly taken care of, the game then concludes. Due to Nick having to sacrifice himself, it is then revealed that he was given a second chance at life with a new, albeit smaller body. Then it ends with Juliet, Nick, and her family walking into the sunset. Overall, you aren't going to play this game for its story, but more so for the jokes during it that sometimes stick. With the non-existent story out of the way, let's now talk about the voice acting. Juliet Starling is voiced by Tara Strong a woman who has had a plethora of voice acting roles, with the prominent ones being Riku from Final Fantasy X, Harley Quinn in the Batman Arkham series, and Raven from Teen Titans. While I would like to bring up the other voice actors, their histories are not as diverse as that of Tara Strong. But for what it's worth, everyone starts from somewhere, and the cast in this game is sufficient. 
The real problem with the game is not the cast's inability to do their job, but more so its unpredictable nature, script-wise, that fails to make the plot or the jokes relevant to the player. Lastly, let's also talk about the overall replayability of this game. Once it has been beaten, new items are added to the Chop 2 shop for purchase and the very hard difficulty is added. If you wanted to get all the achievements in this game, you would then have to play through the harder difficulties. In these harder difficulties, you can encounter the name zombies not found in the standard difficulty as well as the other numbered lollipops. So it does have some collectibles that may be worth the replay at a later date. This game in particular took me around 5.5 hours to complete through my first playthrough, so its length is dirt nasty short. This is the saving grace of Lollipop Chainsaw, in one man's opinion. It is short and at times repetitive, but the experience is not long enough to ruin it. Some people do not have the time to invest into 50 hour RPGs or their favorite live service game. This is one title that caters to hitting you hard, fast, and without much investment. Overall, Lollipop Chainsaw is an amalgamation of equally interesting but also impractical ideas. For one, this game does not hide its appeal to a male audience with its fan service. This is something that if a game is upfront about it, then it's not worth the discussion as you know exactly what you are getting yourself into. In the case of Lollipop Chainsaw, I felt like it was an edge to get players in, but ultimately what keeps the player is the ludicrous gameplay. The combat could have been more responsive, as with Juliet's movement, but if you loaded this up and treated it like a mindless hack and slasher, then it could be therapeutic. Speaking of therapy, this game is not one for everyone, and it is clear that it's not meant to be. So if you have tried this game in the past and did not like it, then do not feel bad as a lot of what draws players in is also what may drive them away. Regarding what media outlets had to say about the game at the time of its release, I do concur with some of their complaints when it comes to the game and its execution. However, with hindsight being 2020, the game as a product of its time does carry some significant weight. While Lollipop Chainsaw does not excel in its combat or story, there is one aspect of this game that helps to set it apart from the others that came around the same time. That one aspect is its honesty. This game is what it is and never tries to be anything else. Additionally, it represents that lost era in gaming where it was okay for content to be uncensored. This game is rated M4 adults and it's for a reason. So I can understand why this game is considered a classic amongst a small group due to what it represents and not necessarily the content contained within it. With that being said, Lollipop Chainsaw, please take it away.